Hello. We're here at the Javits Center uh, for the second day of AI Summit New York, and I'm talking to Sam Ringer, uh, machine learning engineer at Speechmatics. Yes. Um, uh, Sam, and you, you talked at the event, sort of like uh, I think uh, previously, and, and, and you talked about basically the latest disruptions in speech recognition. Yeah, technology. yeah. So um, for people who are not in the audience, could you uh, tell us, tell us sure, a little bit? Sure, sure. About... Um, so, you know, I was just talking a little bit about the sort of research I do at the company. Um, one of the trends that we're starting to see take off in speech industry is that there's been a lot of progress um, you know, in the machine learning field in natural language processing. Like it's been a really crazy 18 months. It's been a lot, a lot of technical development yeah. um, in a family of algorithms called unsupervised learning. Mm -hmm. And so you know, there's a lot of companies here who are basically building companies on top of the latest breakthroughs in unsupervised learning in text and in language. Uh -huh. um, but those same algorithms can also be applied to speech. So how can we learn stuff from speech without using labeled data? So you know, the stuff I'm working on is trying to really leverage those unsupervised learning algorithms to see the same breakthroughs we've seen in NLP, but to sort of bring those through to speech. Um, so that's a trend that's is really starting now. I think we're going to see a lot more of it in 2020 and 2021. Uh, so that's that's a trend that is not quite mainstream yet, but it's headed that way. And that's, I think it's a, really going to be an interesting one to watch. Um, okay. And, and what's the problem with, with, with label data? You know, like why can't yeah. you just get, get it as much as you so want? So there's, there's uh, quite a few things. Um, one is, it's just super expensive. So, you know, we train transcription systems at Speechmatics and we'll typically, some of our English models will be trained using about five to 6,000 hours of labeled data. Uh -huh. And getting a hold of that data is hard. It's expensive. You've got to make sure, you know, it covers all the domains that you're interested in. Um, it's also, it can be mislabeled. Yeah. So a problem if, that we, we had at Speechmatics is um, if people used to, if it was a video of a talk and it was being transcribed, when people started clapping, yeah. our models would think that the word applause was being said. So it'd say applause, applause, applause. Okay. Because when these data was labeled, someone who was labeling it said, oh, this is applause here. So that's an example that we've said since fixed, but just by having labeled data, it introduces the possibility that the labels can be wrong, mm -hmm. which is a big problem. And the, the thing that, you know, I think is underappreciated as well is that humans really don't need very much labeled data. We can just sort of explore the world and pick up patterns in a very unsupervised way. So it is at least theoretically possible to come up with strong unsupervised solutions or weakly supervised solutions to these, these problems because we can do it. So, and you know, we um, can essentially transcribe stuff perfectly uh, regardless of noise in the background and accents and, and stuff like that. So if we, if we can um, leverage how humans learn, I think not only will we save money um, because we don't have to come up with labeled data. Um, there's less room for labeling error because there's just a smaller amount of labels. And also it should lead to better, better results um, moving forwards. Um, so yeah, that's the sort of area I'm excited by that I hope, hope we're going to start seeing some progress with in the coming years. Okay, and, and, and do you think that, that, that we'll have at least like three or four companies, we, 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 labeling data is their specialism. They're yeah. right here on the show floor. Do you yeah. think all of those guys are going to get out uh, of business? It's something I've thought a lot about actually. And I think it kind of depends on um, what sort of data you're labeling. So I'll, I'll sort of use two examples of big companies that I could probably have a go at without getting into too much trouble. So uh, one example is um, Tesla. Mm -hmm. You know, they have cameras in all their cars. They're filming, every time someone's driving a Tesla, they're filming that. And they either will then pay lots of money to get that data hand labeled. You know, they have whole pipelines of how can we quickly label this data really, really accurately. And that's really, really expensive. And it's working. You know, they're seeing a lot of progress in their self-driving cars. Um, but humans can learn to drive in about 20 hours, okay? So that's, that's a sort of, at least, we should be able to solve that problem using a much, much, much smaller amount of labeled data. Like way fewer, order of, way fewer orders of magnitude, less data. So one of Tesla's big assets is they have access to this huge amount of data, labeled data. I'm not sure in, I don't want to speculate when, but I hope that there will come a time where that is no longer an asset. We're just having access to, you know, a million images of traffic lights where someone said this is the traffic light. I don't think there's going to be huge amounts of value in that going forwards. However, a company like Facebook, on the other end of things, has a very specific sort of data. You know, has data about you and about me. And it can draw insights that humans wouldn't be able to do otherwise. So if it's data that can be labeled quickly by humans, I think medium to long term, I'm not sure how much value there is about building businesses just to solve that problem of doing stuff that humans can do easily. However, like Facebook, they have a very specific sort of data. And that, that is, I, I don't see a situation where that data becomes devalued over time. Um, so I think it depends what sort of data you're working with.
So with unsupervised learning, is the idea is it kind of like dramatically lowers barriers to entry, you know, like anybody yeah, can have yeah. a self-driving car if an algorithm can, 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 exactly. can teach yeah. itself in, yeah. in hours instead of, you know, like years. Yeah, and there, there is more um, unlabeled data out there than you can shake a stick at, right? Um, so a lot of these advantages of NLP have happened because there is so much text data out there. Just You can just download the entirety of the internet. Yes. Um, and if we can see strong algorithms in, you know, vision and speech that label that, yeah, leverage that unlabeled data as well. I think, yeah, it's really going to lower the barrier to entry in terms of um, just, you'll just need less high quality labeled data to get started. It's just easier to collect that big pool of data to sort of be on your way. So I think that's quite exciting. It should enable particularly smaller businesses to compete with like larger companies like, you know, Google or maybe Tesla. So I think I think that's really exciting. Okay, and, and, and do you think like, because um, you obviously deal with speech interfaces, right? Yeah. So, so do you think eventually it will become the preferred method of interacting with technology? Because yeah, yeah, it makes sense, doesn't it? So, so we interact with each other by speaking to each other. Uh, we don't interact with each other like, you know, people text each other, but we're not going to have a conversation over text if we're sitting next to each other. So, you know, a period in time I, I really like was sort of this like late 1960s period in America where the big problems they were trying to solve was how do we interact with our machines? Yeah. And so you had the idea of, you know, um, folders and a desktop and a mouse and all this stuff were ideas that people um, were seen as being quite out there at the time. Like, oh, you can interact with your computer in a way that isn't just a command line. Yeah. Um, yeah, so if we can interact with our computers in a more natural way with our voice, I think that's going to be really powerful. And you can, you can start to see it in things like Alexa and Google Home. People, if we can make these technologies work, it is a natural way of doing so. I don't think it's going to quite replace the hardcore tech aspect of it. Like, are people going to be really writing code using their voice? Like, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, if, if we can interact with our machines in the way we interact with each other, which is our voice, I think that will really change um, our relationship with technology, similar, similar to how you know the smartphone changed our relationship with how we interact with technology through touch, or um, you know a mouse changed how we interact with our computers. You suddenly didn't have to use a keyboard. So I, it'd be cool to think that there could be a similar sort of revolution on the horizon if um, you know the power of voice really realizes its full potential. Okay, yeah, yeah. and then it's going to be interesting because it's probably yeah. going to happen in our lifetime, right? Yeah, so I hope so. I hope so. It's not. It's not there yet, right? You know. The stuff that we do at Speechmatics, we're, we're trying hard to solve these problems, but um, you know, a, a lot of the machine learning systems people are using at the moment, they're still quite brittle. You can't just deploy them in super noisy environments. Um, so there, there are definitely problems that need to be solved before we can do this, both in terms of the transcription and the understanding part. But they're problems that, that should get solved in hopefully the mid to long term. So I, as a journalist, like uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of transcription services, yeah. you know, yeah. automated yeah. transcription. And yeah. those things have been have started getting so much better, you yeah. know, like yeah. things like Otter AI and, and, mm -hmm. and the rest of it. Okay, um, and, and you guys are based in Cambridge, UK, yeah. right? Which is uh, an important uh, just location on a, on a yeah, sort of like technological yeah. map of the world. Yeah. So what are maybe per, the benefits and drawbacks of being based in, a, in, an, in an established technology hub? Um, I mean, personally, I really enjoy it. So uh, there's lots of different perks. So one is obviously just from a hiring perspective. So machine learning, it's quite fairly new fields. To get people that actually do it well is it, quite hard. Mm -hmm. So if you're in a city like Cambridge, um, which has a fair amount of these people knocking around, it just makes starting a business easier. Um, you know, Cambridge as well as a university town. Um, I was at university there. A lot of people who work at Speechmatics were at the university. Our founder was a, um, a don at the university. So really strong ties there just makes it easier that that sort of pipeline from research straight into a commercialized setting is um is much stronger through being somewhere like cambridge and also just just living there is is you know fun it's because yeah. because a lot of the time you know we spend a lot of time in our own little ai worlds sort of thinking about things that there's not a huge amount of people who care about but being in a community where there are other people who care about the stuff is you know makes can make things a little less isolating yeah. uh, in terms of the drawbacks i I can't, I can't think of too many. I don't know if you have any ideas. How, okay, how about competition for talent? The fact that there's, okay, yeah. there's a lot of talent, but everybody knows about it. So, yeah, and and, and I can imagine you're not the only machine learning you know, yeah, company exactly, in Cambridge. Exactly. Yeah, I think that can be problematic. Um, a benefit to you know, being in a student town is typically students are sort of more like unrealized potential. And if you, if you can sort of grab them as they're coming out of university before they go and work at Google for a few years, that, that makes it easier. Um, it also creates a healthy, um, ecosystem in terms of if you're, you know, working in Cambridge and you can say, well, look, I've got job offers from X, Y, and Z. They pay them this, and they get to work like this. 
just from a, a laborer's perspective, I think it gives you more, more leverage and more bargaining power, which is, which is probably a good thing. And, and if you think your tech is good and your company is good, then you, even if it's a competitive job market, you should always think you're going to come out ahead in that competition. Oh, so it shouldn't, shouldn't be a thing. You. So if, if you really believe in what you're doing, which you know we do at Speechmatics, then, um, then it's not so much an issue. If you don't quite trust what you're doing, then I suppose you could be a bit more um, scared that people are going to leave you for, for maybe someone that's a bit better. Um, but yeah, definitely something that kind of we think about, for sure. Yes. A lot of the innovation in, in machine learning comes from the open source community. You could say yeah, pretty yeah. much all innovation. Yes, okay. yes, yeah. So, so, so how, how important, like, wh why do you think that is and how important is open source for, for you and Speechmatics? Yeah, so I, I can only really speak from a um, sort of a machine learning perspective. But firstly, like all our servers run Linux, which is, you know, just makes provisioning virtual machines a lot easier. And um, we use a lot of containerized technology. So being able to say, you know, from Ubuntu 18.4 at the start of your, your Docker file makes life a lot easier instead of having to use an OSX or Windows system. Um, something that affects me more on a day-to-day -day basis is what machine learning framework I'm using. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm, I'm an unashamed PyTorch evangelist. Um, it just, it, particularly when you're doing research and you're trying to do very custom things, having um, an open source and very active community in the form of PyTorch just lets you do custom stuff with a lot more flexibility than if you were trying to use some sort of proprietary solution. So um, I, I think as well, there's a very strong community in, in machine learning on the research side to share your research. So, you know, you can go to like, maybe you're involved in biotech and you want to read a paper. You might, if you're not affiliated with the university, it can cost like hundreds of pounds to read that paper, which is kind of insane. Whereas in the machine learning community, we have something called Archive, which everyone will put all their research for free on Archive, um, which it just means it's so much easier to learn stuff, right? Um, and you know, I, I mean, get interested in some area, I can just download the top 20 papers and read all of them because there's this sort of community and this almost expectation that, look, we're all going to share our research, it, everyone's going to be better off because of it, and we can all learn a lot from each other. So I think that's a, a real benefit and a real underappreciated reason as to why machine learning is moving at the pace it is, is because all the research is available all the time. Anyone can look at it for free. And it suddenly moves the people who can work on these fields from outside you know, the universities, maybe from Cambridge University, anyone in the world can look at all of these papers. So I, I think that can only really be a positive force. And um, just for fun, um, yeah. what has been the most unusual sort of like machine learning projects you have ever sure. worked on? Um, so quite an interesting one we did is we were, so because we're a transcription company, mm -hmm. a lot of transcription, right, that you just come out, it's just lowercase words, one after the other. Yeah. But as well as we're reading English, it should be capitalized, it should have commas, question marks, full stops. So we, um, using some of the latest techniques and architectures of NLP, we built a punctuation system. Which was, it was a lot of fun, you know, I got quite obsessed with punctuation for six months and debating where, like, should there be a comma here, should there not be a comma here? So that, that was, that, and it was quite hard scoring that, but there, there was a period, because we, the Speechmatics, we, um, we have, like, we support over 30 different languages. Uh -huh. And adding, I was at a point where I was adding support for punctuation to Korean. And, you know, I'm not a Korean speaker, and I was sort of reading Korean on my, my computer trying to work out, like, is there a pattern? Should there be a full stop there? Maybe that should be a question mark. And I thought this is kind of a surreal moment, how someone who hasn't ever said a word of Korean in their life can be trying to deploy a state-of-the-art punctuation system in Korean. And then like the next day I was trying to do Uzbek and trying to figure all that sort of stuff out. And then it was Russian the day after that. So that was all, that was, that was kind of fun. It was kind of surreal, like, okay, you know, I'm quite highly leveraged here. I can try and solve these problems without maybe having that huge amount of expertise. So that was that was kind of weird, but a lot of fun. Okay, at the that's same a time. brilliant example yeah. because uh, yeah, I never, I never thought about it like that. But yeah, absolutely. From a language yeah. to a language, like variation is wild, and and, yeah. and yes, and, and 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 I guess programmers just like languages, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly, exactly. Maybe a language that you sort of can control a bit more than uh, maybe natural language. Um, but yeah, I was just really fun because I was I was having to sort of spot patterns in the Korean things because we were writing some tests and like, okay, should, does that symbol match this symbol? And uh, that was kind of fun. Yeah, All right. Yeah. Well, thanks, Sam. I mean, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, it sounds like a, like a great job. So, yeah, well, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And thanks for coming along. Yeah, cheers. Thank you. Perfect.